first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to come and talk to you today. And um, I was uh, told that uh, most of the audience does not have a background in uh, graphene physics. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction to graphene. And actually, it's, it's not going to be very brief in the sense that it's going to comprise two of those lectures. And uh, I will try to deal with all the important properties, uh, electronic properties and transport properties of graphene. And the purpose is to tell you what graphene is and uh, why people are interested in graphene and what are the applications of graphene. So essentially, uh, the title of the talk is Electronic Transport in Graphene and the outline uh, and the outline of the lectures is uh, I'm going to uh, do an introduction of graphene, relativistic physics in a non relativistic setting. So it's, the first lecture is going to be essentially an introduction wherein I'll uh, uh, drive the energy dispersion relation to graphene. And that is very important for uh, actual also we will come to realize that uh, the particles in graphene, the quasi particles in graphene are massless and they are very the dark gradient. And then the second lecture is going to be, I feel this is, uh, this will involve a bit of uh, 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 tedious algebra to some extent, but I'm going to not uh, dwell too much into it. But we'll reach some important uh, uh, milestones at the end of this lecture. And then in the second lecture, quantum transport in graphene, uh, I'll discuss what, what were, are the essential differences that graphene brings in as far as quantum transport is concerned. And in the third lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, the effect of an external magnetic field on uh, graphene, quasi-particles in graphene, which, which we realize are draft fermions. <coughs> and uh, the last lecture, uh, I, I had a rather tough time deciding what to say in the last lecture, because there's so much uh, in, in the graphene physics field, it's difficult to put, put in a uh, putting all of those stuff in, uh, in the last uh, lecture, but all I thought was some problems of current interest like the band gap engineering, graphene super lattices, velocity modulation, artificial graphene and so forth. I thought that these are some important applications that would be worthwhile to know about them. So that, that will be the last uh, lecture of this series. But before we go to graphene, it would be a good idea as a condensed matter physicist to tell you why we do condensed matter physics. And what are the reasons for uh, going into studying uh, and finding new materials? And one of the important aspects is, 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 as you know, is the practical aspect. A lot of these uh, devices that we are so fond of, like uh, cell phones and laptops, uh, they are a direct result of research done on materials. And uh, a case in point definitely is the transistor, uh, which is probably the most important invention of the 20th century. And without the transistor, you won't have all these devices. And uh, this is a picture of Bardeen, Bertain, and Shockley, uh, who, who in, uh, the three of them at Bell Labs were responsible for inventing the transistor. And this is a prototype of that original transistor that, is, uh, that was kept in the Bell Labs uh, Museum. And uh, they won the Nobel Prize for this uh, important work. Uh, in this respect, uh, there's an important uh, uh, Moore's law which tells you that uh, the number of transistors on chip doubles approximately every two years. So as far as scaling down and miniaturization of uh, uh, integrated circuits are concerned and making these devices uh, uh, miniature, this, uh, this trend, has, uh, the industry has followed this trend for the last uh, almost 40 years. And uh, people believe that for a few more years, this trend will be followed. But what happens after that uh, is, is a big question mark. And the research on new materials is very important uh, in that respect. Then uh, uh, from a theoretical physicist's point of view, it is also important uh, that uh, we study these new materials and devices because uh, they're fundamental physics a new fundamental physics uh, comes out of it. Because uh, these materials 
are uh, sort of a laboratory for this for this quantum many body phenomena. And in these systems, you see a lot of new collective behavior and new phenomena like symmetry breaking, electron electron interactions play a very important role in some of these materials, and role of disorder. And and what and an example in graphene that you find is that uh, there are emergent new kind of behavior that occurs in these materials. Particles that uh, that form these materials are very different from the quasi particles that emerge in these materials. Uh, as you saw in the first uh, slide, I, there was a uh, was a mention of uh, Dirac fermions. Dirac fermions are a new kind of quasi particles that emerge in, in graphene, and uh, they are. Uh, they have very special properties, and a lot of our uh, time today will be, uh, and the next lecture uh, will be spent on on discussing those special properties. So before uh, we uh, we start graphene, <coughs> uh, talking about graphene, it would be a good idea to sort of uh, uh, step back a little and and think about how we study crystalline solids, and uh, especially the electronic properties of these crystalline solids. So when we are studying these uh, the electronic properties of uh, crystalline solids, uh, we need to consider two very important components that come into play. Is that uh, the electrons have a wavelength? You see, when we are doing quantum mechanics, what quantum mechanics brings in is that to give these particles wave-like attributes, and that is very fundamental and very important when you are studying the electronic properties of, of materials. And uh, for crystalline solids, uh, it's important to realize that uh, these crystalline solids, in these crystalline solids, uh, atoms are periodically arranged, and that is a very important role to play. So, these two uh, points have to be kept in mind when we are studying uh, the electronic properties of uh, these crystalline solids. And an important relation that needs to be considered and be derived, and which is very important in understanding. Uh, the properties, electronic properties of these uh, materials is uh, the dispersion relation. It tells you the energy of these particles as a function of the wavelength. And uh, a goal, a, a major goal of, uh, of studying electronic properties of material is to derive the dispersion relation. Not an easy task by any means. But uh, we'll see how we go about it in a special and important system that we are interested in today is in graphene. So this is sort of a road map on how you go about doing it. Uh, if you start with an electron in free space, all of us are familiar with its properties. It's dispersion relation. It behaves like a free particle, like a parabolic dispersion relation, energy and wave number are par parabolically related. And uh, if you start with an electron in free space, and uh, the sec next level of complication that you can include is that you can consider the conduction electrons in the material as forming a free electron gas, confined in a sort of a three-dimensional solid. So, for all intents and purposes, you're considering an electron gas which is not interacting with each other, and these electrons are essentially the conduction electrons. So you have the nuclei and the core electrons and the conduction electrons. But in this case, when you're in the first approximation that you're uh, studying, and for, for many metals, it turns out that this model is, uh, is very successful, and that's why I've called it unreasonable success of the independent electron model. Because it's unreasonable success, the reason I say this is because uh, these electrons are not free or not non-interactive. They are highly interactive in the sense that they charge. They have Coulombic interaction between each other. And uh, if you think about it, they also have strongly interact with the nuclei, which are also charged. So it is very surprising that we can ignore all these interactions and still, to a large extent, determine the properties of materials on the basis of this very simplified model. And many properties of, of uh, metals, like their specific heat and so forth, comes out correctly uh, in this independent electron model. So it was a big surprise for a long, long time. Why does it work? Why is it so successful? 
the other instances like if you talk about the cohesive energy, for example, or try to determine superconductivity, the phase transition, you cannot go to this uh, independent electron. You cannot, cannot really rely on it. And you have to have a better approximation. So when you talk about a better approximation, what you do is on the, ne uh, the next level of sophistication is that you place that electron in a periodic form. So if you spend solid, the ions of the ions in the core electrons they will form a periodic potential in which these uh, electrons reside. And so the next level of sophistication is including that the effect of the periodic potential. Now it's not an easy task to uh, solve that with this problem with the electrons in this uh, periodic potential. And you, so what you have to do is sort of like the two two uh, distinct ways of approaching this problem. One of them is the nearly free electron model, wherein uh, you treat the you treat the periodic potential as a small perturbation, and that is affecting the electrons, and you determine this perturbation. This works very well for uh, for systems where the electrons are moving wide. In the other sense, systems where the bands are wide, alkaline matrix, for example, whereas uh, the other distinct method is the tight binding electron model, where you consider the electrons to be more or less localized around the level sites. And there's a small probability of the electrons popping or propagating from one side to another. This is called the tight binding electron model. It works for, for other materials, depending on what their bonding is, essentially for those systems or those materials where the electrons are more localized, narrow band materials. And for example, like uh, uh, nickel oxide and all these kind of materials, the transition metal oxides. And so, uh, these are two distinct ways of doing it. Other way is to go and do perform a sort of a even issue electron modeling, where you use, for example, the uh, Lipin functions and the density function theory, and do a numerical calculation of the bands. And this is a this is sort of like a whole industry uh, where where people do uh, work out the band structure and determine the, uh, the properties of uh, materials. Professor, can we interrupt you with questions? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just asking, can oh. we do that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Up till now, I have no question about yeah. it. Uh, I, I would welcome that. Yeah. So this is uh, just to show you what, what we're talking about putting some mathematics in so that you see it better. Uh, so electron in empty space, what we're talking about here is that we essentially have to solve this time independent Schrodinger. So this is the time independent Schrodinger equation. Uh, this is the wave function. This is the energy eigenvalue. Essentially energy is a function of the wave number. This is this gives you the dispersion relation and this is the Hamiltonian operator. So for a free particle uh, you can just ignore, uh, put this equal to zero, the potential energy term, and you have this kinetic energy term, the kinetic energy operator. And uh, as you all know from your force and quantum mechanics, uh, this is, I presume, uh, the solutions are plane based solutions, and the energy dispersion relation comes out to be uh, this in energy dispersion relation that I hinted at uh, before, where the energy is parabolically uh, related to uh, the wave number, square of the wave number. So when, a, when the next level of sophistication that I said, as I said earlier, is that you include the potential energy term, and the potential energy that you include uh, is a periodic potential energy, because of the periodic potential of the lattice. And once you do that, you have what is called the block, uh, block waves, or block wave function, it should have a psi kx here, and u kx, this, this quantity here, uh, has the periodicity of the lattice. So essentially, what you have different from the plane wave solution is that you have this modulation coefficient. So it's a modulated plane wave when you include the effect of the periodic potential, and this is called the Bloch's theorem, and uh, it came out of the work by Felix, Felix Bloch, who, who did a lot of this uh, work, uh, about uh, 70, 80 years back. And uh, one of the most important results 
in condensed matter physics. So, I mean, sorry, it's not, it's not coming out so well here. Uh, when I talk about a crystal structure, just to, just to sort of uh, give you a uh, very simple background of it, uh, we have a Bravis lattice. Bravis lattice essentially is that uh, in this lattice of uh, the periodic arrangement of points, where uh, all the points are identical. And uh, then you can place a single atom or more than an atom, number of atoms on these uh, lattice points, and what you get is a crystal lattice. This is a triangular lattice, which is a Bravis lattice, whereas uh, this hexagonal lattice can be mapped onto a, a Bravis lattice. And what that means is that you can choose a unit cell which has two atoms in it, each of these unit cells has two atoms in it. This, this, uh, this is a unit cell and has two atoms in it. That two atom unit cell is a Bravis lattice. And the importance of a Bravis lattice is that that Bravis lattice is periodically repeated. So you can use this block theorem and so forth to determine the properties. And that is kind of important. So what you showed was a two atom basis, right? Two atom basis, exactly. And it is actually, it will turn out that uh, this is relevant to graphene because in graphene these two atoms are going to be... I asked basically to highlight that point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, those two atoms are going to be carbon atoms. Yeah. Um, carbon uh, is an element, is an old element which comes in various forms and some of those forms are, now we are coming to graphene. Uh, so some of those forms are older forms like we are all familiar with, like graphite and diamond and some some are more recent forms, recently discovered forms. Recent means that in the last uh, 20 years or so, and some more recent, like buckyballs. Uh, they were discovered around uh, early 90s. And uh, then uh, carbon nanotubes, and graphene is more recent, 2004. And uh, this, the, the interesting aspect of these uh, newer forms are that they are low dimension, in the sense that uh, a graphene, as you'll see, is a two-dimensional form of carbon, and uh, carbon nanotubes are one-dimensional, and buckyballs are essentially zero-dimensional. So here we come to graphene, and graphene is a single sheet of carbon atoms, and uh, it is the building block of all other graphene structures. This is graphene single sheet of carbon atoms where the carbon atoms are on a hexagonal lattice. And uh, if you have these layers of graphene, what you obtain is graphite. And if you roll this graphene sheet, you get a carbon nanotube. And uh, this wrapped up graphene uh, is, is a buckyball. What about the borders? Uh, yes. They couldn't be. They couldn't be. They must lack. They lack a linkage. Exactly, and this is very important when you consider graphene nanorivers. If you uh, cut a sheet of graphene, so the at dangling at, uh, bonds at, at the edges, they play a very important role in that. So uh, I'll talk about that later when I come to graphene nanorivers. That's part of the uh, last uh, lecture. But you're right. When you when you uh, at this level what we are considering is a sort of like a infinite two dimensional graphene sheet, not worrying about the edges at this stage. So sort of like we are looking at uh, the bulk <coughs> properties of graphene, away from the edges. But edges have an important role to play, especially when you take small, smaller ribbons of graphene. <coughs> can this uh, cylinder of graphene, can it be closed like this to form a torus or not? Uh, there is no natural structure as such that has been discovered yet, which is, which is like a torus. The only structures that come out are these carbon nanotubes or, or in this form of buckyballs. So uh, none that I'm aware of. Uh, some of the headlines, and now we are talking, uh, coming to graphene, some of the headlines that uh, appeared around the time that people realized that they had found a new and important material uh, this was from the economists that electrons travel through it it's so fast that their behavior is governed by the theory of relativity rather than classification. So whenever you know to write these uh, 
journalists uh, write about science, there's always uh, some hype created and not always very, very pure physics of science. Inside every pencil, there's a neutron star waiting to get out. That is New Science of 2006. And in physics today, we'll have to rewrite the theory of metals for this problem. This is from an eminent scientist, so we will take his word for that. And we try to see uh, what is this new physics that will come out. So before the discovery of graphene, what was the conventional wisdom in the field? The conventional wisdom was that uh, a two-dimensional sheet uh, would not be stable against the nuclear. What that means is that uh, uh, you see at any finite temperature, these atoms, they vibrate about their equilibrium position. And it was, uh, uh, and there's a theorem in finance matter physics, Norman Wagner theorem, which says that there cannot be long wave order in uh, dimensions less than three. And so, people believe that uh, thermal fluctuations or fluctuations of the atoms about the mean position would result in melting of the solid. Uh, so you won't have a two-dimensional solid structure. And uh, so it would not be possible to isolate briefing. It would not be possible to do a systematic study on briefing because these materials will not, it will not be possible to have these materials or to isolate these materials. They will just melt away. But, but if I said two two-dimensional electron gas was there in solids for 30 years or so discovered. So why that would not have melted? I mean, there are two reasons I mean, I would say. <laughs> Uh, one is that two-dimensional electron gas is two-dimensional, but there is still, uh, uh, you can talk about the wave function or the probability of the electron to be outside the plane, there is a finite probability there. So it's, it's essentially that uh, electron gas is, is confined in a, in a, in a potential well. And secondly, yeah, secondly, the thing is that these two-dimensional electron gas is essentially a conduction electron that we are talking about, and there is few electrons that are moving around. So it's not a crystalline solid as such. And the second thing is that uh, uh, even the, when we're talking about isolation of graphene, uh, we're talking about a, a single sheet which is not part of any other system. Because in graph even in graphite, you have these sheets yeah, which are stacked up. Stacked up. So right. in that case, uh, there's no stability. Is there, stability right, there. So if you, if you have it attached to a substrate, right. it would be stable. Uh, single, uh, isolating single planes of briefing. So in 2004, like I said earlier, there was a belief that uh, it would not be possible to isolate briefing in the lab. And that, both of these, uh, this, this belief was turned out, turned out to be false, like so many uh, predictions in, in science. Uh, and what happened was that uh, Andre Geim and uh, Kostya Novoselev at the University of Manchester uh, they were able to isolate single layers of graphene. And the method that they used was uh, is called mechanical exfoliation or the scotch tape method. And it's called the scotch tape method because uh, essentially what they did was they took a sheet of graphite and rubbed it against a substrate, attached a scotch tape to it, and peeled off the sheet uh, scotch tape such that uh, by doing this this over and over, they were able to come bring it down to a single layer of paper. So in a sense, every time you, you write with a, uh, with a pencil, you're leaving uh, graphene sheets on a piece of paper. But what they were able to do was, not only that they were able to isolate a single sh uh, sheet of graphite, that is graphene, but also they were able to do systematic electronic property transport studies on it. I mean, the, the second part is also very important. Because not only that, they had those sheets, but they were able to do experiments on them. They were able to attach contacts and do measurements, like quantum hall measurements on them, and show that they had a single sheet of graphite, graphene, and uh, it had very interesting properties. So both of these were very important uh, achievements, and, uh, and those were recognized by the Nobel Committee, and they won the Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize last year. And at the same, uh, almost the same time, uh, Philip Kim's group at Columbia University, uh, they were also trying to uh, isolate graphene. And the method that they used was that they attached uh, graphite to an AFM cantilever. 
and when they moved it against this uh, substrate, they were able to leave small uh, crystallites of, of, of graphene, but they were actually multi layers of graphene, not single layer. So they were not able to achieve a single layer. The Andre Gaim and Novoslav were the uh, ones who were able to achieve these, these single layers. And then they did this uh, optical uh, microscopy measurements where they were able to see the contrast between single layer and multiple layers and, and they proved and showed that uh, they, uh, they had single layers. Quite an uh, experimental achievement. And nowadays there are various other fabrication techniques. Uh, epitaxial graphene where uh, uh, silicon carbide is heated to very high temperature such that silicon uh, atoms they evaporate away, leaving behind uh, a graphene sheet on, on, uh, on the substrate. And then there's other method is the chemical vapor deposition of hydrocarbons, wherein uh, hydrocarbons are introduced and on, uh, they deposit them metal surfaces, leaving uh, uh, graphene sheets on top. And then the substrate can be etched away, and you can have graphene. So these are. Uh, as far as uh, Gang and Novoslav's original method, which is uh, micro-mechanical cleavage method, that was a that's a good method for painting single sheets of uh, graphene, but uh, that was more of a proof of principle method, in the sense that the early experiments were done, but it's not a, a method for producing large-scale uh, graphene sheets. So these methods are more uh, relevant to painting large. Uh, Dr. Sabi, for epitaxial growth of graphene. Which substrate is preferred? Uh, silicon carbide. Uh, as far as uh, graphene electronic structure is concerned, since uh, uh, I mentioned earlier that graphene is a, is a sheet of carbon atoms, and each carbon atom has four valence electrons. And out of these four valence electrons, three electrons in S, Px, and Py orbital, if they hybridize to form uh, the sigma orbitals, and these sigma orbitals uh, are the planar orbitals that give the rigidity and strength to the graphene sheet. Whereas the fourth electron is in the PZ orbital, which is perpendicular to the plane. They are more or less vocalized, and they have the most important role to play. These uh, PZ orbital electrons, they have the most important role to play. Because when you bring these, these carbon atoms together and these uh, S, P, X, P, Y orbitals, when they hybridize and form the sigma bonds, the P, Z orbitals, they form the pi bind bands. And these are more or less delocalized electrons and very important uh, for you know, transport properties. So sigma bonds give it the exceptional structural rigidity, whereas the pi electrons allow conduction. So for, as far as electronic transport properties are concerned, uh, these pi electrons are the most important and significant. So the pi electrons are they like uh, the electrons, pi electrons? Yeah, they get more and more or less like three. Because on both sides, you've got yes, more or less like three electrons. But uh, still, uh, uh, if you think about it, we have to consider that they're more or less localized now around their uh, atomic sites, but they have a finite probability of uh, of going to new neighboring sites and so forth. So next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, use this this uh, sort of knowledge to derive the dispersion relation for these pi electrons in the tight binding model. So you'll see the kind of approximations that we are making to derive the dispersion relation, and that will give you a better idea of what these uh, electrons are. Uh, this is a transmission micrograph. Uh, transmission electron micrograph from the Berkeley group. Uh, somehow, uh, the picture came out better on my uh, laptop, and uh, but you can still see the hexagonal structure uh, and the nearest neighbor distance of carbon atoms is 0.14 nanometers. When it comes out right, it's a beautiful picture, worth a thousand words. And again. Uh, it's from this uh, uh, nano letters from the Berkeley group where they have this electron microscope image. And you can see the hexagonal lattice, which is very important, as we'll see. So I'm talking about this hexagonal lattice that uh, uh, the previous slide had the micrograph of. And the unit cell that we are uh, 
uh, uh, considering the two atom unit set uh, that we mentioned earlier. And uh, these A and Bs, uh, These are always the problem with, the, with these pointers. These <laughs> 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 Another reason for continuing research yeah. on material science. Continue funding. Continue funding. <laughs>
two atom unit cell. That unit cell is a, a parallel, sort of an equilateral parallel, parallelogram. And if you keep repeating that, you essentially have a Bravis lattice. So the important thing is that you, the hexagonal lattice is not really a Bravis lattice here. Because uh, A and B sides are not identical. So to, to have an, all the sides identical, you have to choose that A, B as the, as the basis. But I think there are many choices of for A, B here because each neighboring atom has three different, A has three different Bs with it. Yes. So I mean, you can choose, but whatever calculation that you do for a unit cell, since it's a periodic structure, and you get the same, you get the same result for any, any of these unit cells. So it's a, you can choose a, a, any unit cell and do this calculation on. So essentially what we're going to do is, we're going to look at the unit cell. That's the whole purpose of, uh, of dealing with the, that's the advantage of dealing with these crystalline structure which are periodic. Oh, okay. We're not done here yet. So what you do is you, you, you take these uh, uh, wave functions and uh, you substitute them in the time independent Schrodinger equation that we have. So you have this, this essential equation where you need to determine Ek. And the next step that you do is you, there's an easier way to do a tight binding calculation, which can be done in like, like uh, five, six, maybe even, even eight, nine steps, very simple steps. But then that requires second quantization. So here I'm assuming that nobody here uh, knows second quantization, even though I'm, I can see that a lot of people know it. But if I, uh, so but I'm here uh, just for the sake of keeping it as simple as possible, I'm not using any of those uh, creation annihilation operators and so forth. So I'm, I'm trying to do it as simply as possible. So once you have this equation, if you multiply this equation by phi A star, the complex conjugate, and phi B star separately, you get uh, these equations, the above two equations. And if you integrate these over all space, uh, space occupied by the lattice, these are the two equations that we obtain. And these can be simplified if we define these matrix elements, these two matrix elements. Since uh, all A's and B's are essentially given, so S A and S B B and H A and H B B are equal. Further, since uh, these correspond to real physical observables, they also commission, and so you can uh, relate them as so. And you obtain these equations in terms of these matrix elements. Going, if you go further, uh, so just, yeah, you obtain these uh, these equations, and now in these equations. What you need to do is, uh, you need, I mean, I'm stressing all the K and R indices. So in these equations, uh, you can eliminate CA and CBs and obtain an absurd for the energies, which is the energy dispersion relation essentially, in terms of these matrix elements, HAA, HAB, and SAA, and so forth. Well, can you go one slide back just for a second? And if you do that, sorry, if you do that, what you obtain is a quadratic equation. If you eliminate CA, for example, take CB from here and put it in here, you obtain a quadratic equation for E. And if you solve the quadratic equation, you get this. Uh, here should be there should be a minus plus minus A. And this is a quadratic equation. Later on, we'll associate plus and minus with positive and negative energies. That will turn out to be important. E0k okay, that is also in terms of these matrix elements. A, and uh, now we are, what we're going to do is really use type binding. Because what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to make an approximation. And the approximation is that we're going to uh, we'll say that the electrons can only hop to the nearest neighbors. This is called the nearest neighbor approximation. So an electron on side A can only go to its nearest neighbor B sex. That I showed you earlier. There are three nearest neighbor B sex. So once you do that, 
you can simplify these matrix elements and perform these integrals and you get for example for HAA you get this E to P which is close to essentially the energy of the PZ atomic orbit. So you take that value and you also SA also sim simplifies considerably and further uh, you can also show that SAB and SBA uh, vanishes such that you have a very simple dispersion relation uh, which even though we are talking about uh, uh, we are talking about this dispersion relation in uh, 2011 but it was uh, first derived in 1947 by Wallace when he was studying graphite so it is a, uh, a very old dispersion relation but people when they uh, discovered graphene they realized that this dispersion relation has a lot of relevance and this uh, energy E2P which was atomic orbital energy we can take this to the uh, zero energy and uh, so the reference energy and so it, it becomes this simple form in terms of these uh, matrix elements um, HAB matrix elements and then the nearest neighbor approximation uh, when we are talk, when we are calculating HAB, we only have to sum over three terms related to the three nearest neighbors. When each A atom has three nearest neighbors, if you remember our previous slide where we had that figure, where we had this figure, each A atom has three nearest neighbors. So essentially, you're summing over uh, the, uh, these three. You have actually these three terms. R M uh, is essentially the unit cell that goes B atoms are. So this is M is equal to one, two, and three. So you get these three terms. R one, R two, R three are the unit. R are the lattice vectors. Uh, where uh, atom B is atom, uh, the three uh, B atoms, and in your pin, this is the bit. E M that appears here is sort of like a phenomenological parameter that has to be determined through experiments, essentially experimental results. And so in the literature it is usually uh, denoted by gamma. So you have, if you, since in the dispersion relation you require this quantity, HAB and HAB star, and so you have these terms, which is very easy to do because now you can use trigonometric identities to, to finally obtain this result in terms of kx and ky wave numbers and uh, if you substitute it into the, into the relation for the energy you obtain this result. Now for low energies the approximation that is made is that uh, you make a Taylor expansion around kx and ky and you can reduce this to this linear dispersion relation. The energy is linearly related to the wave number. And gamma is, is written in terms of uh, Vf is introduced in place of gamma. So it is like uh, uh, it can be related to uh, the speed of the quasi particles in the field. In case it's like Fermi velocity? It is like a Fermi, yeah, Fermi speed. Okay. So this is the. Capital N. N is the number of unit cells. Number, number of units. Capital N is the number of unit cells. Goes from one to one. Total number of unit cells. And this is, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the in reciprocal space, the, the unit cell is a hexagon, and it has six points, which are called the K points. Three of them are equivalent in the sense that. Three of them are related by a reciprocal lattice vector, so they are given. So essentially, there are only two different uh, k points, and near each of these uh, k points, the dispersion relation is, is 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 conical in the sense that it's linear. And as, if you remember the last slide, uh, if you look at this last slide, there's a there's a plus and a minus sign here. Plus sign corresponds to positive energies, or uh, the electron. 
discordant relation, whereas the minus sign corresponds to the, uh, the whole discordant relation. So there, there is, in the same discordant relation, the same discordant relation carries information about both, uh, carries information about electrons as well as poles. So this is, near the K points, the dispersion relation is, is linear. So when we say that uh, low energy properties in graphene, as far as low energy properties in graphene are concerned, the energy dispersion relation is linear, it is, uh, it is difficult to define this low energy. It depends a lot on the applications. But more or less, when we talk about uh, one electron volt within uh, the Fermi energy, e or this, where we put the Fermi energy, which is EF is equal to zero. So uh, uh, around one electron volt in this, uh, in either direction, we are saying that the dispersion relation is more or less linear. And further, uh, since we did a tight binding calculation where we included only the nearest neighbor interaction, if we include the next nearest neighbor interaction, then this linearity does not hold. So in some instances, we need to consider that. But uh, as far as uh, majority of electronic properties studied so far, linear dispersion relations found to be very important in course. And, for, and uh, another point, to be important point that needs to be made is that uh, uh, since these have uh, 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 energy dispersion relation for, for particles in graphene, these pi electrons in graphene, uh, you see, in, in, a, in a condensed matter system, you shouldn't really say that these are these are pi electrons because these are now more are a different kind of a particle because it's also interacting with the lattice and the hexagonal lattice, and that is the reason in the light binding calculation we we made sure that that we. Uh, realized that we were doing this calculation where the periodic letters have that hexagonal symmetry and that resulted in obtaining this very special dispersion relation. So these particles are very special, not exactly those by electrons. So these new emergent particles, these are what are known as uh, Dirac fermions. And uh, since they obey a linear dispersion relation, so they also, the Hamiltonian corresponding to that uh, is this, this uh, two dimensional. Uh, Dirac Hamiltonian, where uh, sigma is not the uh, spin, does not signify spin, but it corresponds to the sublattice, sublattice index. Because there, you know, there are actually two sublattices. One is the sublattice sub of A atoms, another is the sublattice of B atoms, and uh, the electronic wave function has an amplitude to be on A and B lattices. So their contribution appears as, as the sig can be formally written uh, in terms of the sigma matrix and the sigma matrix corresponds to the sub matrix index and, uh, and you, can, you can easily check that the wave functions corresponding to this Hamiltonian are, uh, are these uh, spinners where theta k uh, is given here in terms of ky and kx where this k index here, this, this k is the wave number and this k is, is the, uh, represents the two k points. One is k and other is k prime. And as I mentioned earlier, that there are two equivalent k points or the Dirac points uh, in, the, in the reciprocal unit cell or in the Brillouin zone. And uh, one is k and one is k prime and uh, in many, many instances one can uh, ignore one of the values. They are called the values because of the cones. So one can ignore in many instances, one can ignore uh, or consider only a single value and do a calculation. But in, in, in other cases, which I will talk about later, uh, one has to consider both these uh, values because electron can scatter from the value k to value k prime. And uh, lastly, uh, an important property of these uh, electronic states or the Dirac fermion states is that uh, one can define a sort of a helicity operator uh, and these states that I mentioned on the previous uh, uh, slide are also eigenstates of this helicity operator. And uh, that will turn out to be very simple. Uh, so they're usually called in this uh, for this massless uh, 
there are great electricity and uh, and chirality are treated equivalently. And so we so the draft like wave equation has a number of intriguing implications and uh, we'll talk about that uh, in the next lecture. So I'm ending the lecture here.
uh, in the last on the last slide uh, was the sigma dot k operator sigma yes. dot or sigma dot p over p if you want to write magnitude of p. So that uh, so that what that means is that the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian operator are also uh, the eigenstate of the helicity operator in this case. So one can have uh, simultaneous eigenfunctions uh, for both these operators because obviously this will be. So if there are no uh, further questions, then we must thank uh, our worthy speaker for very exciting first introductory, I would say, uh, lecture on the field. Thank you.